Chapters 16 through 18 of Space Viking by H. Beam Piper. Read by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Space Viking. 16. So Andre Dunnan was haunting him again. Tiny bits of information came in. Dunnan's ship had been on Hoth, on Nergal, selling loot. Now he sold for gold or platinum, and bought little, usually arms and ammunition. Apparently his base, wherever it was, was fully self-sufficient. It was certain, too, that Dunnan knew he was being hunted. One space viking who had talked with him quoted him as saying, I don't want any trouble with Trask, and if he's smart he won't look for any with me. This made him all the more positive that somewhere Dunnan was building strength for an attack on Tanith. He made it a rule that there should always be at least two ships in orbit off Tanith in addition to the Lamia, which was on permanent patrol, and he installed more missile-launching stations both on the moon and on the planet. There were three ships bearing the ward, swords and atom symbol, and a fourth building on Graham. Count Lionel of New Haven was building one of his own and three big freighters shuttled across three thousand light-years between Tanith and Graham. Caesar Carval, who had never recovered from his wounds, had died. Lady Lavina had turned the barony and the business over to her brother, Bert Sandrason, and gone to live on Excalibur. The shipyard at Rivington was finished, and now they had built the landing legs of Harkeman's Corsandi II, and were putting up the skeleton. And they were trading with Amaterasu now. Pedrosan Pedro had been overthrown and put to death by General Dagro Hector during the disorders following the looting of Eglinsby. The troops left behind in Stalgalan had mutinied and made common cause with their late enemies. The two nations were in an uneasy alliance with several other nations combining against them, when the Nemesis and the Space Scourge returned and declared peace against the whole planet. There was no fighting. Everybody knew what had happened to Stalgaland and Eglinsby. In the end, all the governments of Amaterasu joined in a loose agreement to get the mines reopened and resume production of gadolinium, and to share in the fissionables being imported in exchange. It had been harder, and had taken a year longer, to do business with Beowulf. The Beowulfers had a single planetary government, and they were inclined to shoot first and negotiate afterward a natural enough attitude in view of the experiences of the past. However, they had enough old Federation period textbooks still in microprint to know what could be done with gadolinium. They decided to write off the past as fair fight and no bad blood and start over again. It would be some years before either planet had hyperships of their own. In the meantime, both were good customers, and rapidly becoming good friends. A number of young Amaterasuans and Beowulfers had come to Tanith to study various technologies. The Tanith locals were studying, too. In the first year, Trask had gathered the more intelligent boys of ten to twelve from each community and begun teaching them. In the past year, he had sent the most intelligent of them off to Graham to school. In another five years, they'd be coming home to teach. In the meantime, he was bringing teachers to Tanith from Graham. There was a school at Trade Town, and others in some of the larger villages, and at Rivington there was something that could almost be called a college. In another ten years or so, Tanith would be able to pretend to the status of civilization. If only Andre Dunnan and his ships didn't come too soon. They would be beaten off, he was confident of that, but the damage Tanith would take in the defense would set back his work for years. He knew all too well what space Viking ships could do to a planet. He'd have to find Dunnan's base, smash it, destroy his ships, kill the man himself first. Not to avenge that murder six years ago on Graham, that was long ago and far away, and Elaine was vanished, and so was the Lucas Trask who had loved and lost her. What mattered now was planting and nurturing civilization on Tanith. But where would he find Dunnan in two hundred billion cubic light-years? Dunnan had no such problems. 
he knew where his enemy was. And Dunnan was gathering strength. The yo-yo, Captain Van Humphert. She had been reported twice, once in company with the Starhopper and once with the Enterprise. She bore a blazon of a feminine hand dangling a planet by a string from a finger, a good ship and an able, ruthless captain. The Bolide, she and the Enterprise had made a raid on Ithun. The Gilgameshers had settled there and one of their ships had brought that story in. He recruited two ships at once on Melkarth and there was a good deal of mirth about that among the Tanith space vikings. Melkarth was strictly a poultry planet. Its people had sunk to the village peasant level. They had no wealth worth taking or carrying away. It was, however, a place where a ship could be set down. And there were women, and the locals had not lost the art of distillation and made potent liquors. A crew could have fun there, much less expensively than on a regular Viking base planet, and for the last eight years a Captain Niall Burrick of the Fortuna had been occupying it, taking his ship out for occasional quick raids and spending most of the time living from day to day, almost on the local level. Once in a while a Gilgamesher would come in to see if he had anything to trade. It was a Gilgamesher who brought the story to Tanith, and it was almost two years old when he told it. We heard it from the people of the planet, the ones who live where Burrick had his base. First there was a trading ship came in. You may have heard of her. She is the one called Honest Horus. Trask laughed at that. Her captain, Horus Strastroff, called himself Honest Horus, a misnomer which he had also bestowed on his ship. He was a trader of sorts. Even the Gilgameshers despised him, and not even a Gilgamesher would have taken a wretched craft like the honest Horus to space. He had been to Melkarth before, the Gilgamesher said. He and Burrick are friends. He pronounced that like a final and damning judgment of both of them. The story the locals told our brethren of the fair dealer was that the honest Horus was landing beside Burrick's ship for ten days when the two ships came in. They said one had the blue crescent badge, and the other bore a green monster leaping from one star to another. The Enterprise and the Star Hopper. He wondered why they had gone to a planet like Melkarth. Maybe they knew in advance whom they'd find there. The locals thought there would be fighting, but there was not. There was a great feast of all four crews. Then everything of value was loaded aboard the Fortuna and all four ships lifted and spaced out together. They said Burrick left nothing of any worth whatever behind. They were much disappointed at that. Have any of them been back since? All three Gilgameshers, Captain, Exec, and Priest, shook their heads. Captain Gurash of the Fair Dealer said it had been over a year before his ship put in there. He could still see where the landing legs of the ship had pressed into the ground but the locals said they had not been back. That made two more ships about which inquiries must be made. He wondered for a moment why in Gehenna Dunnard would want ships like that. They must make the Space Scourge and the Lamia, as he had first seen them, look like units of the Royal Navy of Excalibur. Then he became frightened, with an irrational retrospective fright at what might have happened. It could have, too, at any time in the last year and a half. Either or both of those ships could have come in on Tanith completely unsuspected. It was only by the sheerest accident that he had found out, even now, about them. Everybody else thought it was a huge joke. They thought it would be a bigger joke if Dunnan sent those ships to Tanith now, when they were warned and ready for them. There were other things to worry about. One was the altering attitude of His Majesty Angus I. When the Space Scourge returned, the newly titled Baron Valkenhayn had brought with him, along with the princely title and the commission as Viceroy of Tanith, a most cordial, personal audiovisual greeting, warm and friendly. Angus had made it seated at his desk, bareheaded and smoking a cigarette. The one which had come on the next ship out was just as cordial but the king was not smoking and wore a small, gold-circled cap of maintenance. 
By the time they had three ships in service, on scheduled three-month arrivals, a year and a half later, he was speaking from his throne, wearing his crown, and employing the first-person plural for himself, and finally the third-person singular for Trask. By the end of the fourth year there was no audiovisual message from him in person, and a stiff complaint from Rovard Grofus to the effect that His Majesty felt it unseemly for a subject to address his sovereign while seated, even by audiovisual. This was accompanied by a rather apologetic personal message from Graufus, now Prime Minister, to the effect that His Majesty felt compelled to stand on his royal dignity at all times, and that, after all, there was a difference between the position and dignity of the Duke of Wardshaven and that of the planetary King of Graham. Prince Trask of Tanith couldn't quite see it. The king was simply the first nobleman of the planet. Even kings like Rodolphe of Excalibur or Napoleon of Flambert didn't try to be anything more. Thereafter he addressed his greetings and reports to the Prime Minister, always with a personal message, to which Grofus replied in kind. Not only the form, but also the content of the messages from Graham underwent change. His Majesty was most dissatisfied. His Majesty was deeply disappointed. His Majesty felt that His Majesty's colonial realm of Tanith was not contributing sufficiently to the royal exchequer. And His Majesty felt that Prince Trask was placing entirely too much emphasis upon trade, and not enough upon raiding. After all, why barter with barbarians when it was possible to take what you wanted from them by force? And there was the matter of the Blue Comet, Count Lionel of Newhaven's ship. His Majesty was most displeased that the Count of Newhaven was trading with Tanith from his own spaceport. All goods from Tanith should pass through the Wardshaven spaceport. Look, Rovard, he told the audiovisual camera which was recording his reply to Grofus. You saw the space scourge when she came in, didn't you? That's what happens to a ship that raids a planet where there's anything worth taking. Beowulf is lousy with fissionables. They'll give us all the plutonium we can load, in exchange for gadolinium, which we sell them at about twice Sword World prices. We trade plutonium on Amaterasu for gadolinium, and get it for about half Sword World prices. He pressed the stop button until he could remember the ancient formula. You may quote me as saying that whoever has advised His Majesty that that isn't good business is no friend to His Majesty or the realm. As for the complaint about the Blue Comet, as long as she is owned and operated by the Count of Newhaven, who is a stockholder in the Tanith Adventure, she has every right to trade here. He wondered why His Majesty didn't stop Lionel of Newhaven from sending the Blue Comet out from Graham. He found out from her skipper the next time she came in. He doesn't dare, that's why. He's king as long as the great lords, like Count Lionel and Joris of Biglersport and Allen of Northport, want him to be. Count Lionel has more men and more guns and contragravity than he has now, and that's without the help he'd get from everybody else. Everything's quiet on Graham now, even the war on South Main Continent stopped. Everybody wants to keep it that way. Even King Angus isn't crazy enough to do anything to start a war. Not yet, anyhow. Not yet? The captain of the Blue Comet, who was one of Count Lionel's vassal barons, was silent for a moment. You ought to know, Prince Trask, he said. Andre Dunnan's grandmother was the king's mother. Her father was old Baron Zarvas of Blackcliffe. He was what was called an invalid the last twenty years of his life. He was always attended by two male nurses about the size of Otto Harkeman. He was also said to be slightly eccentric. The unfortunate grandfather of Duke Angus had always been a subject nice people avoided. The unfortunate grandfather of King Angus was probably a subject everybody who valued their necks avoided. Lothar Fale had also come out on the Blue Comet. He was just as outspoken. I'm not going back. I'm transferring most of the funds of the Bank of Wardshaven out here. From now on, it'll be a branch of the Bank of Tanith. This is where the business is being done. 
It's getting impossible to do business at all in Wardshaven. What little business there is to do. Just what's been happening? Well, taxation first. It seems the more money came in from here, the higher taxes got on Graham. Discriminatory taxes, too. Pinched the small landholder and industrial barons, and favored a few big ones. Baron Spasso and his crowd. Baron Spasso now? Bale nodded. Of about half of Glaspeth, and a lot of the Glaspeth barons lost their baronies, some of them their heads, after Duke Omfray was run out. It seems there was a plot against the life of His Majesty. It was exposed by the zeal and vigilance of Sir Garvin Spasso, who was elevated to the peerage and rewarded with the lands of the conspirators. You said business was bad, as business? Bale nodded again. The big Tanith boom has busted. It got oversold. Everybody wanted in on it. And they should never have built those two last ships, the Speedwell and the Good Hope. The return on them didn't justify it. Then you're creating your own industries and building your own equipment and armament here. That's caused a slump in industry on Graham. I'm glad Lavina Carval has enough money invested to live on. And finally, the consumer goods market is getting flooded with stuff that's coming in from here and competing with Graham industry. Well, that was understandable. One of the ships that made the shuttle trip to Graham would carry enough in her strong rooms, in gold and jewels and the like, to pay a handsome profit on the voyage. The bulk goods that went into the cargo holds was practically taking a free ride so anything on hand, stuff that nobody would ordinarily think of shipping in interstellar trade, went aboard. A two-thousand-foot freighter had a great deal of cargo space. Baron Trask of Traskin hadn't even begun to realize what Tanith Base was going to cost Graham. 17. As might be expected, the Beowulfers finished their hypership first. They had started with everything but little know-how which had been quickly learned. Amaterasu had had to begin by creating the industry they needed to create the industry they needed to build a ship. The Beowulf ship, she was named Viking's Gift, came in on Tanith five and a half years after the Nemesis and the Space Scourge had raided Beowulf. Her skipper had fought a normal drive ship in that battle. Beside plutonium and radioactive isotopes, she carried a general cargo of the sort of luxury goods unique to Beowulf, which could always find a market in interstellar trade. After selling the cargo and depositing the money in the bank of Tanith, the skipper of the Viking's Gift wanted to know where he could find a good planet to raid. They gave him a list, none too tough, but all slightly above the chicken-stealing level, and another list of planets he was not to raid planets with which Tanith was trading. Six months later they learned that he had showed up on Capera, with which they were now trading, and had flooded the market there with plundered textiles, hardware, ceramics, and plastics. He had bought Craig meat and hides. "'You see what you did now?' Harkeman clamored. "'You thought you were making a customer. What you made was a competitor. What I made was an ally.' If we ever do find Dunnan's planet, we'll need a fleet to take it. A couple of Beowulf ships would help. You know them, you fought them too." Harkeman had other worries. While cruising in Coruscant II, he had come in on Vithar, one of the planets where Tanith ships traded, to find it being raided by a space viking ship based on Zochitl. He had fought a short but furious ship action battering the invader until he was glad to hype her out. Then he had gone directly to Zochitl, arriving on the heels of the ship he had beaten, and had had it out both with the captain and Prince Victor, serving them with an ultimatum to leave Tanith trade planets alone in the future. "'How did they take it?' Trask asked, when he returned to report. "'Just about the way you would have.' Victor said his people were space Vikings, not Gilgameshers. I told him we weren't Gilgameshers either, as he'd find out on Zachittal the next time one of his ships raided one of our planets. 
Are you going to back me up? Of course, you can always send Prince Victor my head with an apology. If I have to send him anything, I'll send him a sky full of ships and a planet full of hell-burners. You did perfectly right, Otto, exactly what I'd have done in your place." There the matter rested. There were no more raids by Zochitl ships on any of their trade planets. No mention of the incident was made in any of the reports sent back to Graham. The Graham situation was deteriorating rapidly enough. Finally, there was an audiovisual message from Angus himself. He was seated on his throne, wearing his crown, and he began speaking from the screen abruptly. We, Angus, King of Graham and Tanith, are highly displeased with our subject, Lucas, Prince, and Viceroy of Tanith. We consider ourselves very badly served by Prince Trask. We therefore command him to return to Graham and render to us account of his administration of our colony and realm of Tanith." After some hasty preparations, Trask recorded a reply. He was sitting on a throne himself, and wore a crown just as ornate as King Angus, and robes of white and black Imhotep furs. "'We, Lucas, Prince of Tanith,' he began, are quite willing to acknowledge the suzerainty of the King of Graham, formerly Duke of Wardshaven. It is our earnest desire, if possible, to remain at peace and friendship with the King of Graham, and to carry on trade relations with him and with his subjects. We must, however, reject absolutely any efforts on his part to dictate the internal policies of our realm of Tanith. It is our earnest hope. Damn it, he'd said earnest. He should have thought of some other word. That no act on the part of His Majesty the King of Graham will create any breach in the friendship existing between his realm and ours. Three months later, the next ship, which had left Graham while King Angus Summons was still in hyperspace, brought Baron Rathmore. Shaking hands with him as he left the landing craft, Trask wanted to know if he'd been sent out as the new viceroy. Rathmore started to laugh and ended by cursing vilely. "'No, I've come out to offer my sword to the King of Tanith,' he said. "'Prince of Tanith for the time being,' Trask corrected. "'The sword, however, is most acceptable. I take it you've had all of our blessed sovereign you can stomach?' "'Lucas!' You have enough ships and men here to take, Graham," Rathmore said. Proclaim yourself King of Tanith, and then lay claim to the throne of Graham, and the whole planet will rise for you. Rathmore had lowered his voice, but even so the open landing stage was no place for this sort of talk. He said so, ordered a couple of the locals to collect Rathmore's luggage, and got him into a hall car, taking him down to his living quarters. After they were in private, Rathmore began again. "'It's more than anybody can stand. There isn't one of the old great nobility he hasn't alienated, or one of the minor barons, the landholders and industrialists, the people who are always the backbone of Graham. And it goes from them down to the common folk. Assessments on the lords, taxes on the people, inflation to meet the taxes, high prices, debased coinage. Everybody's being beggared, except this rabble of new lords he has around him, and that slut of a wife and her greedy kinfolk." Trask stiffened. "'You're not speaking of Queen Flavia, are you?' he asked softly. Rathmore's mouth opened slightly. "'Great Satan, don't you know? No, of course not. The news would have come on the same ship I did. Why, Angus divorced Flavia. He claimed that she was incapable of giving him an heir to the throne. He remarried immediately. The girl's name meant nothing to Trask. He did know of her father, a Baron Valdiva. He was lord of a small estate south of the Wardlands and west of Newhaven. Most of his people were out-and-out -out bandits and cattle rustlers, and he was as close to being one himself as he could get. Nice family he's married into. 
a credit to the dignity of the throne. Yes. You wouldn't know this Lady Demoiselle Evita. She was only seventeen when you left Graham, and hadn't begun to acquire a reputation outside her father's lands. She's made up for lost time since, though. And she has enough uncles and aunts and cousins and ex-lovers and what not to fill out an infantry regiment. And every one of them's at court, with both hands out to grab everything they can. How does Duke Joris like this? The Duke of Biglersport was Queen Flavia's brother. I dare say he's less than delighted. He's hiring mercenaries, is what he's doing, and buying combat contra gravity. Lucas, why don't you come back? You have no idea what a reputation you have on Graham now. Everybody would rally to you. He shook his head. I have a throne, here on Tanith. On Graham I want nothing. I'm sorry for the way Angus turned out. I thought he'd make a good king. But since he's made an intolerable king, the lords and people of Graham will have to get rid of him for themselves. I have my own tasks here." Rathmore shrugged. "'I was afraid that would be it,' he said. "'Well, I offered my sword. I won't take it back. I can help you in what you're doing on Tanith." The captain of the free space Viking Dam Thing was named Roger Van Morville Esthersan, which meant that he was some sword worlder's acknowledged bastard by a woman of one of the old Federation planets. His mother's people could have been Nergallers. He had coarse black hair, a mahogany brown skin, and red brown, almost maroon eyes. He tasted the wine the robot poured for him and expressed appreciation then began unwrapping the parcel he had brought in. "'Something I found while raiding on Tetragrammaton,' he said. "'I thought you might like to have it. It was made on Graham. It was an automatic pistol, with a belt and holster. The leather was bisonoid hide. The buckle of the belt was an oval enameled with a crescent, pale blue on black.' The pistol was a plain, ten-millimeter military model with grooved plastic grips. On the receiver it bore the stamp of the House of Hoylbar, the firearms manufacturers of Glaspeth. Evidently it was one of the arms Duke Omfrey had provided for André Dunnan's original mercenary company. Tetragrammaton? He glanced over to the big board. There was no previous report from that planet. How long ago? I'd say about three hundred hours. I came from there directly, less than two hundred and fifty hours. Dunnan's ships had left the planet three days before I got there. That was practically sizzling hot. Well, something like that had to happen sooner or later. The space Viking was asking him if he knew what sort of a place Tetragrammaton was. Neo-barbarian, trying to re-civilize in a crude way. Small population, concentrated on one continent, farming and fisheries, a little heavy industry, in a small way, at a couple of towns. They had some nuclear power, introduced a century or so ago by traders from Marduk, one of the really civilized planets. They still depended on Marduk for fissionables. Their export product was an abominably smelling vegetable oil, which furnished the base for delicate perfumes and which nobody was ever able to synthesize properly. I heard they had steel mills in operation now, the half-breed space Viking said. It seems that somebody on Rimon has just reinvented the railroad, and they need more steel than they can produce for themselves. I thought I'd raid Tetragrammaton for steel and trade it on Rimon for a load of heaven tea. When I got there, though, the whole planet was in a mess not raiding, but plain, wanton destruction. The locals were just digging themselves out of it when I landed. Some of them, who didn't think they had anything at all left to lose, gave me a fight. I captured a few of them to find out what had happened. One of them had that pistol. He said he had taken it off a space viking he'd killed. The ships that raided them were the Enterprise and the Yo-Yo. I knew you'd want to hear about it. I got some of the local stories on tape. Well, thank you. I'll want to hear those tapes. 
Now, you say you want steel? Well, I haven't any money. That's why I was going to raid Tetragrammaton. Niflheim with the money, your cargo's paid for already. This, he said, touching the pistol, and whatever's on the tapes. They played off the tapes that evening. They weren't particularly informative. The locals who had been interrogated hadn't been in actual contact with Dunnan's people except in combat. The man who had been carrying the ten-millimeter hoil bar was the best witness of the lot, and he knew little. He had caught one of them alone, shot him from behind with a shotgun, taken his pistol, and then gotten away as quickly as he could. They had sent down landing craft, it seemed, and said they wanted to trade. Then something must have happened, nobody knew what, and they had begun a massacre and sacked the town. After returning to their ships, they had opened fire with nuclear missiles. "'Sounds like Dunnan,' Hugh Rathmore said in disgust. "'He just went kill-crazy. The bad blood of Blackcliff.' "'There are funny things about this,' Boke Valkenhayn said. "'I'd say it was a terror raid. But who in Gehenna was he trying to terrorize?' "'I wondered about that, too,' Harkeman frowned. This town where he landed seems, such as it was, to have been the planetary capital. They just landed, pretending friendship, which I can't see why they needed to pretend, and then began looting and massacring. There wasn't anything of real value there. All they took was what the men could carry themselves or stuff into their landing craft, and they did that because they have what amounts to a religious taboo against landing anywhere and leaving without stealing something. The real loot was at these two other towns, a steel mill and big stocks of steel at one, and all that skunk apple oil at the other. So what did they do? They dropped a five-megaton bomb on each one, and blew both of them to M.C. Square. That was a terror raid, pure and simple. But as Boke inquires, just who were they terrorizing? If there were big cities somewhere else on the planet, it would figure. But there aren't. They blew out the two biggest cities and all the loot in them. Then they wanted to terrorize somebody off the planet. But nobody heard about it off planet, somebody protested. The Marduckans would. They trade with Tetragrammaton, the acknowledged bastard of somebody named Morville said. They have a couple of ships a year there. That's right, Trask agreed. Marduk. You mean you think Dunnan's trying to terrorize Marduk? Valkenhayn demanded. Great Satan! Even he isn't crazy enough for that! Baron Rathmore started to say something about what Andre Dunnan was crazy enough to do, and what his uncle was crazy enough to do. It was just one of the cracks he had been making since he'd come to Tanith and didn't have to look over his shoulder while he was making them. "'I think he is, too,' Trask said. "'I think that is exactly what he is doing. Don't ask me why. As Otto is fond of remarking, he's crazy and we aren't, and that gives him an advantage. But what have we gotten since those Gilgameshers told us about his picking up Burrick's ship and the Honest Horus? Until today, we've heard nothing from any other space Viking. What we have gotten was stories from Gilgameshers about raids on planets where they trade, and every one of them is also a planet where Marduk ships trade. And in every case, there has been little or nothing reported about valuable loot taken. The stories are all about wanton and murderous bombings. I think Andre Dunnan is making war on Marduk. Then he's crazier than his grandfather and his uncle both, Rathmore cried. You mean he's making a string of terror raids on their trade planets, hoping to pull the Marduckan Space Navy away from the home planet? Harkeman had stopped being incredulous. And when he gets them all lured away, he'll make a fast raid? That's what I think. Remember our fundamental postulate. Dunnan is crazy. Remember how he convinced himself that he was the rightful heir to the ducal crown of Wardshaven? And remember his insane passion for Elaine, 
he pushed that thought hastily from him. Now he's convinced that he's the greatest space Viking in history. He has to do something worthy of that distinction. When was the last time anybody attacked a civilized planet? I don't mean Gilgamesh, I mean a planet like Marduk. A uh, hundred and twenty years ago, Prince Havilgar of Halteclair, six ships, against Aton. Two ships got back, he didn't. Nobody's tried it since, Harkeman said. So Dunnan the Great will do it. I hope he tries. He surprised himself by adding, That's provided I find out what happened. Then I could stop thinking about him. There was a time when he had dreaded the possibility that somebody else might kill Dunnan before he could. 18. Seashat, Obidikat, Lugaluru, Outhomla. The young man elevated by his father's death in the Dunnan raid to the post of hereditary President of the Democratic Republic of Tetragrammaton had been sure that the Marduk ships which came to his planet traded also on those. There had been some difficulty about making contact, and the first face-to-face -face meeting had begun in an atmosphere of bitter distrust on his part. They had met out of doors. Around them spread wrecked and burned buildings, and hastily constructed huts and shelters, and wide spaces of charred and slagged rubble. They blew up the steel mill here and the oil refinery at Jansboro. They bombed and strafed the little farm towns and villages. They scattered radioactives that killed as many as the bombing. And after they had gone away, this other ship came. The damn thing! She bore the head of a beast with three very big horns. That's the one. They did a little damage at first. When the captain found out what had happened to us, he left some food and medicines for us. Roger Fenn Morville Esthersen hadn't mentioned that. Well, we'd like to help you if we can. Do you have nuclear power? We can give you a little equipment. Just remember it of us when you're back on your feet. We'll be back to trade later. But don't think you owe us anything. The man who did this to you is my enemy. Now I want to talk to every one of your people who can tell me anything at all." Seashat was the closest. They went there first. They were too late. Seashat had had it already, and on the evidence of the radioactivity counters not too long ago. There had been two hell-burners. The cities on which they had fallen were still smoking pits, literally burned into the ground and the bedrock below at the center of five hundred mile radii of slag and lava and scorched earth and burned forests. There had been a planet buster. It had started a major earthquake. And half a dozen thermonuclears. There were probably quite a few survivors. A human planetary population is extremely hard to exterminate completely. But within a century they'd be back to the loincloth and the stone hatchet. We don't even know Dunnan did it personally, Patrick Morland said. For all we know, he's down in an airtight cave city on some planet nobody ever heard of, sitting on a golden throne, surrounded by a harem. He had begun to suspect that Dunnan was doing something of just the sort. The greatest space Viking of history would naturally found a space Viking empire. An emperor goes out to look his empire over now and then. I don't spend all my time on Tanith. Say we try out Homeland next. It's the farthest away. We might get there while he's still shooting up Obidikut and Lugaluru. Gwat, figure us a jump for it. When the colored turbulence washed away and the screen cleared, out Homla looked like Tanith or Capera or Amaterasu or any other Terra-type planet a big disk brilliant with reflected sunlight and glowing with starlit and moonlit atmosphere on the other. There was a single rather large moon, and in the telescopic screen the usual markings of seas and continents and rivers and mountain ranges. But there was nothing to show—oh, yes, lights on the darkened side, and from the size they must be vast cities. 
All the available data for out Homla was long out of date. A considerable civilization must have developed in the last half-dozen centuries. Another light appeared, a hard blue-white spark that spread into a larger, less brilliant yellow light. At the same time, all the alarm devices in the command room went into a pandemonium of jangling and flashing and squawking and howling and shouting. Radiation, energy release, contragravity distortion effects, infrared output, a welter of indecipherable radio and communication screen signals, radar and scanner ray beams from the planet. Trask's fist began hurting. He found that he had been pounding the desk in front of him with it. He stopped it. "'We caught him! We caught him!' he was yelling hoarsely. "'Full speed in! Continuous acceleration! As much as we can stand! We'll worry about deceleration when we're in shooting distance!' The planet grew steadily larger. Carford was taking him at his word about continuous acceleration. There'd be a Gehenna of a bill to pay when they started decelerating. On the planet, more bombs were going off just outside atmosphere beyond the sunset line. Ship observed, altitude about a hundred to five hundred miles, hundreds, not thousands, thirty-five degrees north latitude, fifteen degrees west of the sunset line. Ship is under fire, bomb explosions near her, a voice whooped. Somebody else was yelling that the city lights were really burning cities or burning forests. The first voice, having stopped, broke in again. Ship is visible in telescopic screen, just at the sunset line. And there's another ship detected but not visible, somewhere around the equator. And a third one somewhere out of sight. We can just get the fringe of her contragravity field around the planet. That meant there were two sides and a fight. Unless Dunnan had picked up a third ship somewhere. The telescopic view shifted. For a moment the planet was completely off-screen, and then its curvature came into the screen against a star-scattered background. They were almost in to two thousand miles now. Carford was yelling to stop acceleration and trying to put the ship into a spiral orbit. Suddenly they caught a glimpse of one of the ships. "'She's in trouble!' That was Paul Koroff's voice. "'She's leaking air and water vapor like crazy!' "'Well, is she a good guy or a bad guy?' Morland was yelling back, as though Korif's spectroscopes could distinguish. Korif ignored that. "'Another ship making signal,' he said. "'She's the one coming up over the equator. Sword World Impulse Code, her communication screen combination, and an identify yourself.' Carford punched out the combination as Korif furnished it. While Trask was desperately willing his face into immobility, the screen lighted. It wasn't Andre Dunnan. That was a disappointment. It was almost as good, though, his henchman, Sir Neville Orme. "'Well, Sir Neville, a pleasant surprise,' he heard himself saying. "'We last met on the terrace at Carvel House, did we not?' For once the paper-white face of André Dunnan's Amdane showed expression, but whether it was fear, surprise, shock, hatred, anger, or what combination of them, Trask could no more than guess. "'Trask! Satan curse you!' Then the screen went blank. In the telescopic screen the other ship came on unfalteringly. Paul Koreff, who had gotten more data on mass, engine energy output and dimensions, was identifying her as the Enterprise. "'Well, go for her! Give her everything!' They didn't need the order. Van Larch was speaking rapidly into his handphone, and Alvin Carford was hurling his voice all over the nemesis, warning of sudden deceleration and direction change. And while he was speaking, things in the command room began sliding. In the telescopic screen the other ship was plainly visible he could see the oval patch of black with the blue crescent, and in his screen Dunnan would be seeing the sword-impaled skull of the nemesis. If only he could be sure Dunnan was there to see it! If it had only been Dunnan's face, instead of Orm's, that he had seen in the screen! As it was, he couldn't be sure, and if one of the missiles that were already going out made a lucky hit, he might never be sure. 
He didn't care who killed Dunnan or how. All he wanted was to know that Dunnan's death had set him free from a self-assumed obligation that was now meaningless to him. The Enterprise launched counter-missiles, so did the Nemesis. There were momentarily unbearable flashes of pure energy, and from them globes of incandescence spread and vanished. Something must have gotten through. Red lights flashed on the damage board. It had been something heavy enough even to jolt the huge mass of the Nemesis. At the same time, the other ship took a hit from something that would have vaporized her had she not been armored in collapsium. Then, as they passed close together, guns hammered back and forth along with missiles. And then the Enterprise was out of sight, around the horizon. Another ship, the size of Otto Harkiman's Corisandi II, was approaching. She bore a tapering, red-nailed feminine hand dangling a planet by a string. They rushed toward each other, planting a garden of evanescent fire-flowers between them. They pounded one another with guns, and then they sped apart. At the same time, Paul Koreff was picking up an impulse code signal from the third crippled ship. A screen combination. Trask punched it out as he received it. A man in space armor was looking out from the screen. That was bad, if they had to suit up in the command room. They still had air. His helmet was off, but it was attached and hinged back. On his breastplate, was a device of a dragon-like beast perched with his tail around a planet and a crown above. He had a thin, high-cheeked face with a vertical wrinkle between his eyes and a clipped blonde mustache. "'Who are you, stranger? You're fighting my enemies. Does that make you a friend?' "'I'm a friend of anybody who owns Andre Dunnan his enemy. Sword World Ship Nemesis. I'm Prince Lucas Trask of Tanith, commanding. Royal Marducan ship Victrix! The thin-faced man gave a wry laugh. Not been living up to her name so well. I'm Prince Simon Bentrick, commanding. Are you still battle-worthy? We can fire about half our guns. We still have a few missiles left. Seventy percent of the ship's sealed off, and we've been holed in a dozen places. We have power enough for lift and some steering way. We can't make lateral way except at the expense of lift." Which made the Victrix practically a stationary target. He yelled over his shoulder at Carford to cut speed all he could without tearing things apart. When that cripple comes into view, start circling around her. Get into a tight circle above her. He turned back to the man in the screen. If we can get ourselves slowed down enough, we'll do all we can to cover you. All you can is all you can. Thank you, Prince Trask. Here comes the Enterprise, Carford shouted, with obscenely blasphemous embellishments. She hairpinned on us. Well, do something about her. Van Larch was already doing it. The Enterprise had taken damage in the last exchange. Koref's spectroscopes showed her haloed with air and water vapor. Her instruments would be getting the very same story from the Nemesis. Wedge-shaped segments, extending six to eight decks in, were sealed off in several places. The only thing that could be seen with certainty was the blaze of mutually destroying missiles between. The short-range gun duel began and ended as they passed. In the screen, he had seen a fat, round-nosed thing come up from the Victrix, curving far out ahead of the passing Enterprise. She was almost out of sight around the planet when she ran head-on into it, and vanished in an awesome blaze. For a moment he thought she had been destroyed. Then she lurched into sight and went around the curvature of Althulma. Trask and the Marducan were shaking hands with themselves at each other in their screens, Everybody in the Nemesis command room was screaming, "'Well shot, Victrix! Well shot!' Then the yo-yo was coming around again, and Van Larch was saying, "'Gahenna with this fooling around! I'll fix the expurgated unprintability!' He yelled orders, a jumble of code letters and numbers, and things began going out. Most of them blew up in space. Then the yo-yo blew up very quietly 
as things do where there is no air to carry shock and sound waves, but very brilliantly. There was brief daylight all over the night side of the planet. "'That was our planet-buster,' Larch said. "'I don't know what we'll use on Dunnan.' "'I didn't know we had one,' Trask admitted. "'Otto had a couple built on Beowulf. The Beowulfers are good nuclear weaponeers. The Enterprise came back, hastily, to see what had blown up. Larch put off another entertainment of small stuff, with a fifty-megaton thermonuclear, view-screen piloted among them. It had its own arsenal of small missiles, and it got through. In the telescopic screen a jagged hole was visible just below the equator of the Enterprise, the edges curling outward. Something, possibly a heavy missile in an open tube, ready for launching, had gone off inside her. What the inside of the ship was like, or how many of her company were still alive, was hard to guess. There were some, and her launchers were still spewing out missiles. They were intercepted and blew up. The hull of the Enterprise bulked huge in the guidance screen of the missile and filled it. The jagged crater that had obliterated the bottom of Dunnan's blue crescent blazon spread to fill the whole screen. The screen went milky white as the pickup went off. All the other screens blazed briefly until their filters went on. Even afterward they glared like the cloud-veiled sun of Graham at high noon. Finally, when the light intensity had dropped and the filters went off, there was nothing left of the Enterprise but an orange haze. Somebody, Patrick, Baron Moreland, he saw, was pounding him on the back and screaming inarticulately in his ear. A dozen space-armored officers, with planet-perched dragons on their breasts, were crowding beside Prince Bentrick in the screen from the Victrix, whooping like drunken bisonoid herders on payday night. "'I wonder,' he said, almost inaudibly, if I'll ever know if Andre Dunnan was on that ship. End of chapter 18